Thank you, Barbara. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our worship here at Greece Baptist Church in beautiful, sunny Rochester, New York. So happy to have each and every one of you here with us this morning. This is a busy day. We have a lot going on, but we're going to stick to the program and we're going to get everything done. And it's all going to culminate in the end of the service by inviting everybody to join us in the parlor next room here, where we're going to have a, a little bit of cake and a time for uh, fellowship and conversation. And we're going to say thank you to Ed and Joan Wakefield for all they've done to us, for us all, all over the years, as we wish them well, uh, preparing to make their move to their new home in New Jersey. So welcome, everybody. Today is Palm Sunday the day we remember the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem at the beginning of that first Holy Week over 2,000 years ago. This is also the sixth Sunday of Lent. It's our Purple Sunday. Thank all of you who brought in food wrapped and packaged in purple, and those of you who packaged yourselves in purple as well this morning. Uh, thank you for coming and doing that. Our theme verse this morning comes from the beginning of the eighth chapter of Romans where we are reminded that there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. An important assurance for us this morning as we keep moving forward on our Lenten journey toward the cross. We've been looking at different emotional loads that we bear along the journey, and today we're gonna to look at how this promise from Romans helps us to overcome our burdens of guilt. Today is also a communion Sunday so while our handbell choir plays for us in just a moment, I invite any of you who are at home on Zoom to gather something together that you can use as bread in the cup so you can partake in the Lord's Supper with us later in the service. Right now, our handbells are going to play a Palm Sunday medley that Brandon has arranged for us.
Thank you. That was beautiful. Our first hymn this morning is number 203 in the gray hymnals, Hosanna, loud Hosanna. So if you would please stand in body, mind, or spirit as you're able and join me in singing number 203, Hosanna, loud Hosanna. <laughs> seated. Well, good morning, everybody, on this very special day as we begin the week of Jesus entering into the special city. We're going to first have our call to uh, worship, and it's up on the screen as well, and I will look at this purple paper with the black ink, which is testing me a little bit. <laughs> Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. The Lord strong and mighty. Lord, strong and mighty. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. Thank you. We're going to be listening to the uh, words in the Bible that we have heard many times before. Chapter uh, 21, verse 1 through 11. And that's found on page 23 in the Bibles that are found in the sanctuary. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage in the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village ahead of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her, untie them and bring them to me. 
If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of them and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna is the, is the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil saying, who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the pr prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. May we find new meaning to this throughout this week. Amen. So the text I'm going to use this morning actually comes from Romans chapter 8. I'm going to be focusing on the first two verses. I've been a pastor for, I don't know, a lot of years, <laughs> 35 years, I think 34 of those years on Palm Sunday, I've preached about the story of the Jesus and the donkey and riding in in the palms. And I think you've heard that story pretty much. So today we're going to stick with the course we've been on looking at the different emotional loads that we carry going through the, the Lenten season. And today we're focusing on guilt. And I'm reminding everyone of what the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I want everybody to say that with me, okay? There is there now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. We begin <laughs> Holy Week 
with Palm Sunday, the day that we remember the last week of Jesus' life, we remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem when an adoring crowd of people welcomed Jesus, waving palm branches and shouting Hosanna. On Maundy Thursday of this week, we remember the time Jesus spent with his closest followers at the Last Supper. On Good Friday, we remember the agony of the cross. And then on Easter Sunday, we celebrate rebirth, renewal, the fresh, clean start that we all have been offered through Jesus' resurrection to new life. Our journey uh, through the season of Lent, this year we've been trying to focus on these burdens that we carry with us as we approach the cross. We've used the familiar words of what a friend we have in Jesus to remind us of the invitation to bring our burdens to the cross and leave them there in God's hands, to let God's love lift those burdens from us so our lives can be free and filled with joy. So in our sermons through Lent, Pastor Cheryl and I have looked at different kinds of emotional burdens we carry. We looked at the burden of anger and the burden of judgmentalism, the burden of fear, the burden of regret. Last Sunday, Pastor Cheryl preached on the burden of grief. And today I want to talk a little bit about the burden of guilt. At Easter, we celebrate the story of God's grace. It's an amazing story, a powerful story. And yet, though Christians believe that God has forgiven them through what Jesus did, many Christians I know struggle all their lives with feelings of guilt, feeling that they just aren't good enough. No matter what they do, it isn't good enough. The 19th century philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche was one of Christianity's biggest critics and he once said, if Jesus had been really divine, he wouldn't have died on the cross to take away our sins. He would have died on the cross to take away our guilt. Now, I don't think Nietzsche really totally understood Christian theology when he said that, but he was a keen observer of what many Christians had done with that theology. Nietzsche looked around him and he saw a lot of men and women who believed that Christ had died to take away their sins, and yet their lives were still filled with guilt. And Nietzsche looked at those Christians and he said, you know, these believers are more miserable than the unbelievers I know. And he asked the question, what good is a belief that leaves believers crippled and frustrated? I think we can ask that same question when we look around us today. And we see so many Christians that carry overwhelming burdens of guilt with them. So this morning I want to make two distinctions to keep in mind as we think about this whole issue of guilt and how we deal with guilt. And the first distinction is there's a difference between being guilty and feeling guilty. Being guilty is an objective state. Either we're guilty of the offense or we're not guilty of the offense. In our legal system, a person is declared guilty when a judge or a jury examines the evidence and makes the judgment that the defendant has committed a crime. It doesn't make any difference how the defendant feels about the crime. I know we've all heard of cases where the guilty person shows no remorse in the courtroom, right? And on the other hand, it's possible for a court to acquit a person and for that person to still carry a load of guilty feelings with them for the rest of their life. Well, the message of the gospel is this, that despite the objective fact that we are guilty, despite the fact that we all fall short of the mark, God has chosen to intervene on our behalf. And that's the story of Easter. Christ died for us, the righteous dying for the unrighteous, as scripture puts it. And through that loving sacrifice, God extends forgiveness to us. God, the eternal judge, has decided to acquit us of the charges. As a result, we've been freed from the consequences of our guilt. Now, when the news is that good, why is it that so many of us still walk around feeling guilty 
so much of the time. Well, I think a lot of that has to do with the way Christians have been taught the story over the years and the way that we tell this amazing story of grace now. We've had the message of our guilt hammered home, but we haven't really taken in the full message of God's grace. Many times, instead of telling a story as a celebration of God's grace poured out on all of us by a loving God, sometimes we frame that story as a narrow escape that a few of us will experience from the vengeful wrath of a very angry God. Let me try to use a different scenario to try to illustrate how the way we tell a story can change its meaning and effectiveness. Imagine that you saw someone standing in the middle of the road, and you saw an enormous Mack truck bearing down on this person. And the person was oblivious. They didn't see the truck coming. How could you save that person from an imminent and horrible death? Well, we need to convince the person that if they keep standing there, they'll be in danger, right? There's an urgency to get them to move out of the road, and we want to extend a hand to help them get out of harm's way. The danger of standing in the road with that truck bearing down is kind of like the danger we perceive of a guilty person standing in the path of divine justice. God's judgment is coming, and if he doesn't get out of the way, it's going to be awful. And the hand reaching out to the person standing in the middle of the road is like the love of God in Christ offering to pull them to safety. And that's an image I think we can kind of relate to. The question is, how do we get the person in the road to take that hand and be led to safety? How do we convince them of the urgency of their danger? What if the person says, well, I don't see a truck? What if the person says, I don't believe in trucks? Trucks don't exist. What if the person says, I like it out here in the middle of the street? This is where I want to be. Well, that's often the kind of response that we get from unbelievers. Maybe they don't really believe in God or believe that they're in danger where they are. Maybe they just don't want to change the way they live their lives. Now, through the centuries, one way that we have tried to convince people to take that hand of Jesus and get out of the way of the Mack truck is to emphasize the urgency of how much danger they're in. They don't believe they are in danger because maybe they don't feel guilty about their lives. So one way to get them to respond to that offered hand through the centuries the church has used is to try to make them feel guiltier about where they are. So often in its teaching, the church tries its best to make people feel guilty. We come up with doctrines like the total depravity of humanity, teaching that everyone is totally and utterly wicked from birth, from the depths of their heart, that we're all helpless worms in the sight of God, that it's impossible ever to please God with any of our efforts. And we try to scare people with that kind of thinking. The idea that our failures will be fearfully punished by all the torments of hell and then we come up with a lot of gr gruesome embellishments to illustrate just how bad hell is going to be. And that's been one of our strategies to rescue people, right? But if you go back to that scenario of the man on the street and the truck coming toward him, maybe we can think about how odd this particular strategy really is. If you really saw someone in the road about to get run over by a truck, can you imagine deciding that the best way to get that person to move out of danger would be to convince them that they are so worthless that they deserve to be run down by that truck? That wouldn't make much sense, would it? The sad irony 
is that manipulating people's feelings of guilt may work in the short run to convince them of the objective state of guilt that they're in, but it doesn't remove those feelings of guilt and shame. And too many times, even after people accept that hand and receive forgiveness, they still feel inadequate and insecure. They still feel guilty. The church's strategy of making people feel guilty to bring them to the point of conversion backfires. It produces timid Christians, tormented Christians. It produces men and women who learn the lesson of feeling guilty so well, they can't find God's peace when it is offered to them. It can produce guilt-ridden believers who experience the life of faith as one that's full of anxiety. And when the Bible talks about guilt, it's talking about that objective state of being. It's not talking about those subjective guilty feelings that weigh us down and make us miserable. Our English New Testaments, drawing on the Latin translation of the original Greek texts, talks about guilt and salvation in legal, judicial terms. We think of ourselves as being in a courtroom, standing guilty before God, who's the judge, with Christ as our advocate or defender. And in Christ, we're forgiven and acquitted of our shortcomings. And our text this morning assures us that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God has forgiven us from our sins. The psalmist says that God has taken our sins and tossed them away from us as far as the east is from the west, or impossibly far away, far apart. And if God has forgiven me for my sins, if God has taken them away from me like that, and I still feel condemned and guilty, where do those feelings come from? Well, they come because even though God Almighty has chosen to forgive me, I have not chosen to forgive myself. Even though God tolerates me in my imperfections, I haven't learned to tolerate myself. Even though God has chosen to suspend punishment for my sin, I insist on punishing myself over and over again. Even though God accepts and loves me just as I am, I see myself as unlovable and reject myself. God forgives us. When will we learn to forgive ourselves? As far as God's concerned, our text tells us, there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Our guilt has been forgiven. We've been freed to experience peace with God. But as long as we continue to pass judgment on ourselves, as long as we hold ourselves to impossible standards, as long as we condemn ourselves and punish ourselves, our lives will be filled with guilty feelings. We've learned too well how to feel guilty. And we haven't learned well enough to let ourselves experience the freedom from guilt that God's love offers us through Jesus Christ. Now, you might be thinking, well, aren't guilty feelings really the workings of our God-given conscience? Aren't they a mechanism that God gives us to see the error of our ways and to repent? Maybe we even think there's something holy and pious about feeling guilty. You know, if we can't be perfect, well, at least we can show our hearts in the right place by being miserable about not being perfect. But that brings me to the second distinction I wanted to make about guilt this morning. A distinction Paul makes in his writing between what he calls godly grief and worldly grief. The Bible calls us to recognize that we are in that objective state of being guilty before God. It calls on us to repent literally to turn around and move toward God. And remorse, 
those bad feelings we have about the things we do that separate us from God's love, that's what Paul calls godly grief. And godly grief is part of the healing process. It leads us into the loving arms of God who frees us from our bondage to sin and guilt. But the Bible never condemns us to a lifetime of continuously feeling guilty, to punishing ourselves over and over. That never-ending vicious cycle of guilty feelings is what Paul calls worldly grief. And in 2 Corinthians 7, Paul spells out the difference between these two kinds of guilt. Godly grief, Paul writes, produces a repentance that leads to salvation and brings no regret. But worldly grief produces death. There may be pain and feelings of sorrow when we realize what sin has done in our lives, when we realize that we've hurt somebody through the thing that we've done. But that pain produces something in us, a change of heart, a change of direction that leads us to help, to find forgiveness, and to freedom from guilt. And that pain, Paul tells us, brings no regret. That's what Paul calls godly grief, godly guilt. If we come to God's love in Christ, we're not condemned to a lifetime of bondage to guilty feelings. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Godly grief is liberating, but worldly grief produces death. Worldly grief holds on to all those feelings of inadequacy and fear. Worldly grief insists on constantly judging and condemning ourselves. God wants to liberate us from that kind of living death that worldly grief produces in us. The good news of the gospel is that in Christ we can experience God's love and forgiveness in a powerful way that not only makes us able to forgive others who hurt us, but also to forgive ourselves. And that is when we can truly experience freedom from guilt. This morning, as part of our Lenten journey, I'm going to ask each one of you to use those little purple hearts that you were given when you came in this morning and to write something down on the heart that reminds you of something that you carry a feeling of grief about. And you're going to be given an opportunity, if you want to, to come forward and to nail those burdens to the cross, to leave them there for God to take care of so they don't have to plague us as we go through the week. Is there anybody that doesn't have a heart? If anybody, just put your hand up and Jim will bring one to you. It looks like everybody's got one. But I will ask... Um, See, Bill and James, could you come up and grab the cross for me, please, and bring it down? And Marilyn will move the stand and the microphone out of the way. And as we listen to uh, the, the video, I invite you to come forward and bring those burdens and leave them at the cross.
we got one more thing we're going to do first. Um, I'm very happy to be able to welcome a new member into our uh, church family here today. And I'm going to ask uh, Barbara if you'd come forward and Pastor Cheryl and Jeff if you would come down as the chairman of our board of deacons. We have been blessed with Barbara's presence in the short time she's been with us. She's become an integral part of our worship program this mo in the Sunday mornings, accompanying the choir and playing some solo pieces and playing as we sing hymns. And we're so happy to have uh, her make the decision to, to join us and become a member of our Greece Baptist Church family. So, Cheryl, I'm going to grab the microphone. So. Blessed are those who yearn for deepening more than escape, who are not afraid to grow in spirit. Blessed, Blessed are, are those, those who take seriously the bonds of community, community who, who regularly join in celebration and learning, who come, come as much to minister as to be ministered to. to. Blessed are those who understand that the church is often imperfect, yet rather than harbor feelings of anger or disappointment, bring their concerns and needs to the church family. Blessed are those who support, support the, the church and its, and its work through, through their, their giving, giving and who give of themselves as well as, well as their, their material goods. Blessed are those who, when asked to serve, do so gladly. Blessed, Blessed are, those are those who know, who know that, that the work of the church, of the church is the transformation of individuals and of society, who have a vision of the beloved community transcending the present, and who do not shrink from controversy, sacrifice, or change. Barbara, do you desire to affirm your place in the faith and family of Jesus Christ through membership in Greece Baptist Church? I do. Will you strive by the grace of God to be Christ's disciple, to follow in the way of our Savior, to show love and justice, and to witness to the work and word of Jesus Christ as best as you are able. I will. Will you work according to the grace given you to grow in the Christian faith and to be a faithful member of the Church of Jesus Christ, celebrating Christ's presence and furthering Christ's mission in all the world? I will. Do you promise to participate in the life and mission of this family of God's people, sharing regularly in the worship of God and enlisting in the work of this local church as it serves this community and the world? I do. So members of Greece Baptist Church family, will you welcome Barbara in as a new member? And will you offer her support and prayer and encouragement as together we walked uh, along this path of faith that God has laid out for us? We will. Then please read with me. We welcome, we welcome you, you with joy into, into our, our church, church family and affirm our mutual ministry in Christ. In Christ. We promise you our friendship and prayers as we share the hopes and labors of the Church of Jesus Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit, may we continue to grow together in God's knowledge and love and be witnesses of our risen Savior. So on behalf of the members of Greece Baptist Church, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we welcome you into our church family, and we extend to you our right hand of fellowship. Barbara, welcome.
So as our servers come forward, I want to remind everybody that we have an open communion table here at Greece Baptist Church. It's not restricted or limited to members of our church or denomination. Uh, I like to say that it's not Pastor Steve's table and it's not Greece Baptist Church's table, it's the Lord's table. The same Lord who said, whoever comes unto me, I will not cast out. And we say the same thing, whoever comes to us, we do not cast out. We welcome you here. Children of God, rejoice. Sing out in celebration, God's people. Your king is coming to you, humble, riding on a donkey, a donkey's foal. Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna in, in the, the highest. highest. Blessed, Blessed is, is the, the one who comes, comes in the Lord's, Lord's name. name. Glory, Glory to, to God. God. Hosanna. Hosanna. Praise to you, Lord God, our loving friend and parent. You deserve our worship, our love, and our devotion because you have entered our broken world. You have joined us on our journey of pain and pleasure, of sorrow and joy, and have given us access to life eternal and abundant. We lift our voices to praise you, O God. Okay, we celebrate your coming to us, not with political power of military might, not with glamour or fame or wealth, but in humility and love, gently and with great compassion. We, well, we lift our, our voice to, to praise, praise you, O oh God. God. Please join us now in a time of silent prayer, followed by our unison prayer of confession. O Lord, who on this day entered the rebellious city that later rejected you, we confess that our wills are as rebellious as Jerusalem's, that our faith is often more show than substance, 
that our hearts are in need of cleansing. Have mercy on us, Son of David, Savior of our lives. Help us to lay at your feet all that we have and all that we are, trusting you to forgive what is sinful, to heal what is broken, to welcome our praises, and to receive us as your own. Friends, God's steadfast love endures forever. There is no wall high or thick enough to separate us from the love of God. Jesus rode into Jerusalem to save us, and save us he will. In the name of Jesus Christ, be assured that our sins have been forgiven. Amen. Amen. Let us open the gates of our hearts that the the sovereign sovereign God of glory glory may come in. in. Let us lift our voices in praise and thanksgiving. God God deserves deserves all honor and blessing. blessing. It It is is our privilege privilege and joy to exalt the Lord in every place and every moment. And so, dear God, we offer you our worship through Jesus Christ, your Son, who comes to us humbly in a riding on a donkey's foal. The Lord Jesus, on the eve of his death, shared a meal with his followers. Taking the bread, he gave thanks, broke it, and offered it to them with these words. This is my body, broken for you. Remember me whenever you eat. After the meal, taking the cup, he gave thanks and offered it to them with these words. This is my my blood blood poured out out for you. you. Remember Remember me me whenever you drink. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts that through them we may be reminded of the body and blood of Christ. Breathe Breathe your spirit spirit over the the whole earth. earth and make us your new creation, the body of Christ given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us together from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, To you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And so now, O Lord, we eat and drink in memory of Jesus and his great love. And in this simple meal, we proclaim his death and resurrection, giving life to all people. In closing, we're going to sing just the first verse of Bless Be the Tie That Binds. For many, many years before COVID, our tradition in this church was to make a circle around the sanctuary and join hands and sing facing each other. If you're comfortable doing that, I invite you to do that at this time. And we will sing the first verse of Bless Be the Tie That Binds. children fed and nourished closer to me go in love and love by serving joyful and free hear my spirit's power filled you 
Here with tender comfort stilled you. Go, my children, fed and nourished, closer to me. Amen.